Thank you, Community Bookstore. Uh, thanks, Amit, for joining us from Calcutta on, an e on a day which is no longer, it's already passed in your part of the world. And, uh, um, and thanks everybody else for joining us um, on this day, which sees the memorial of um, uh, George Floyd's memorial. I want to express my own solidarity with the people marching in the streets, as well as my shared sense of, of um, uh, grief and horror and anger. Um, I, think I, I think I will begin by um, talking about Amit's book. Uh, it's Friend of My Youth is an apparently um, uneventful book whose action takes place over the course of a year. That is to say, it, it, take, it, there are, it, there are, it, it describes three visits to Bombay, three brief visits of, of, to Bombay uh, by the main character, who is a novelist named Amit Chowdhury. Um, and the first visit takes place in 2010. And um, he is going to read from uh, um, a novel he's just written. But on his mind is the fact that the friend, uh, the one person he still really knows in Bombay, or one of two people really, uh, whom he still knows in Bombay, and whom he always sees when he goes back to Bombay, which happens to be the town in which he grew up, though he never really felt at home because his family is actually from, uh, from Bengal. Um, that that friend is not there to see because the friend is, has, has immured himself in a rehab program after years and years of addiction and after a near fatal overdose. The friend's name is Ramu. And um, so this first section of the book describes a day or two getting ready for the reading, wandering around the old neighborhood because the place where Amit Chowdhury is staying is a, a club cum hotel that is right next to or is in the shadow of uh, the one of the apartments he lived in as a kid and um, going through the old neighborhood running some errands for his wife and uh, mother um, and uh, basically feeling a little bored and a little apprehensive there's an edge of of, of, um, of continuous and unspecified concern but it has clearly to do partly with the absence of the friend and the worries for the friend and also with the memories of childhood. That is the greater part of the book is devoted to that, but then uh, the second visit comes and it turns out Ramu has left um, rehab. And there's a second visit where he and Amit Chaudhary get together and, and in a sense renew old friendship. And then there's an unexpected third visit which uh, Amit Chaudhary and his wife and daughter all make. And again, they briefly see Ramu and the book comes to an end. Um, it is a, as I said, uneventful, but all throughout shadowed by um, the moment it's taking place and the things that took, and the history, uh, both the personal history of the main character, who as is not, is said not to be identical with, with the author who is on the screen with me. Um, and the action also very much takes place on the page in the descriptions of neighborhoods, people, food. Uh, the main character of the book has a taste for food and is particularly keen on certain kinds of food that can only got, be gotten in, in Bombay. Um, but above all, the action is on the words in the page. And I'll turn it over now to Amit to read a section. Thank you, Edwin. And um, I'm grateful to the community bookstore arranging this to NYRB imprints and Edwin being part of this and also for um, pledging the proceeds of this event to Black Lives Matter. That means a lot. Um, um, I'm going to read out from, I'm going to read out a few pages from the first um, section the first more substantial part of this very short book. And that, that part has been described by Edwin already. It's to do with the first visit I described by this um, 
author who coincidentally has the same name as myself to Bombay. But he's uh, staying in a club, which as it happens over, overlooks um, the house in which he, the building in which he grew up. So, so the first third of the, um, the first two thirds of the book describes two days leading up to the reading, which is never described. So on the first day he arrives, he checks into the club, looks out, actually is aware of, 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 of the building opposite, but goes to the Taj Mahal Hotel to change some shoes at a shoe shop for his mother and wife. And, and that's what happens the first evening. Second day he gets up, goes for a walk, confronts the building, is interviewed by a journalist for his previous book from which he's come to read in Bombay. Has lunch with the publishing rep. And lunch is Parsi lunch because Amit Chaudhary in the book, like myself, loves Parsi food. And, um, and it's only available in Bombay in, in any kind of um, real way, this, this very beautiful and delicious cuisine. And one of the things he has with, with the rep is um, a fish called bombil, which is best eaten fried. Then they go to a Strand Bookstall, which unfortunately I don't think anymore, it doesn't exist anymore. He goes there to sign a few books. I mean, this, as you might know, is de rigueur in, 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 on, on, on such occasions, on such visits. After having signed books, he, he just goes out for a walk, parting ways with the publishing rep, um, resolving to see each other again for the 6.30 reading, just as Edwin and I had decided, you know, that we're going to see each other online, of course, um, at this time. So the reading, as I said, is never described. So these are, these are the, not the absolute last pages of that first section, but over here, bit I'm describing is Amit going out for that walk when he has nothing to do but kill time till the reading and the memory of he's he's thinking about his sense of dislocation and unsettlement in Bombay and one of the reasons being um, the absence of Ramu and he's thinking about what that absence means and he's thinking about the last time he felt this absence acutely and that was when Ramu al almost died of it's not a drug overdose but some, some kind of event to do with drugs so this this is the bit I'm uh, reading out where he's thinking about that last occasion of um, near bereavement and, 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 and this acute sense of loss having been experienced once more in relationship to his friend. The uncertainty I feel about whether I'll see Ramu again came to me once before. Of course, I know the formulation is absurd. It's not whether I'll see him, but when. According to his sister, it will be another year. What I feel isn't so much like parental anxiety. With the prolonged absence of a child, say the irrational part of the parent's brain will rush to the possibility of never seeing the child again. This isn't what I feel. I know I'll see Ramu again. But it's as if I won't see him again. I'm thrown off balance but also surprised. I didn't know I'd react like this. Ramu isn't the only close friend I have. But it's as if my sojourn in Bombay depends on him. Depends is the wrong word. 
I haven't come here because of him to delve into his whereabouts. But the surprise I've mentioned is related to my astonishment at being here. Astonishment denotes how you might start thing, seeing things you hadn't noticed earlier, but it could also mean becoming aware that you won't see them again. As I turn into Firoz Shah Mehta Road and then left into the long stretch of DN Road, I know I won't see Bombay again. That is, I will see Bombay again, but not the Bombay I'm looking at now. I belch and release the ghost of Bombil. I need this walk. The first time I had that hunch that my sighting of Ramu when I said bye to him had a finality that neither he nor I was fully aware of, though in a way both of us were, was at GT Hospital, the psychiatric wing. He'd almost died, but as the doctor said, had returned to life against medical logic. I was in Bombay again for a cultural festival. Again, I was in the yacht club. If the hosts won't put me up in a good hotel, I'll ask to stay in a club that's well located. The event was in Bandra. Later, I, Arjun, Ramu, and Amrita, whom Ramu and I knew from college and were seeing after 20 years, thought we'd go to a seafood restaurant. But Ramu broke away early, reminding us it took an hour to get to Kolaba. I was headed there too, but not yet. He set out on his scooter and at some point must have changed his mind and decided to check out the entrance of the Prince of Wales Museum for Pushers at midnight. He overdosed there on dodgy heroin and when a constable discovered him at 3 a.m., his blood pressure was near zero. This nameless constable found a friend's number on a piece of paper in Ramu's wallet, called him. The friend phoned Ramu's father. Ramu's father had to run down Kolaba Causeway because there were no taxis to be seen at 3.30. He got his unconscious son to GT Hospital. The, room at the, yacht club are, are, the rooms at the yacht club are cavernous, but the skylights have no curtains. I was woken by an orange glow above me. Thankfully, day begins late in Bombay. By and by, I called Ramu. A maid with no Hindi kept picking up the phone. She instructed me in Marathi that Ramu was in the hospital. I wondered if his father had fallen ill. He was then 80 years old. In the evening, at long last, I spoke to Ramu's father. He related the sequence to me. I said I'd go to GT Hospital the next day. I didn't know where GT Hospital was. I was told it was next to Crawford Market. I'd been to Crawford Market as a child, a willing accomplice in my parents' expeditions to gather Alfonso mangoes or track down Bombay duck, or to go the, from there in the heat to the alleys of Zaveri Bazaar to browse gold jewelry. In the morning, I found GT Hospital in the midst of this. I hadn't known. I went into a driveway. I confronted an unostentatious colonial, colonial structure. Bombay doesn't know me, but also there's so much of Bombay I haven't begun. To. Also, there's so much of Bombay I've just begun to know. Through the corridors, I went to ICU two families on a bench outside, a girl in a salwar kameez reading the Bible, the page open at Samuel. He'd come back from the dead, the young doctor, an intern from a small town, told me. It defied reason. I loved the hospital, its resolute calm, its ability to accommodate even in the bustling main stairways, droves of family members and well-wishers. When he got better, Ramu showed the doctor an interview with me that had appeared the previous day in the Times of India with a photo of me squinting in the sunlight on Carter Road. This is very good, said the doctor, moving his head in consternation, as if he'd examined something infinitely stranger than a medical report. Very good. They moved Ramu two days later to the psychiatric ward, 
compulsory because of the overdose, all free of charge. I marveled at these easy, unimpeded transitions from ward to ward. Every room there had the depth and width inherent in rooms in buildings the British left behind. Most people in the ward were laboring people and workers. When I went to see Ramu, they were all quietly eating lunch. Not Ramu, he was awaiting a tiffin carrier from home. We sat on his bed, talked, and strangest of all, treated the surroundings as normal. Strange for us, ordinarily so intolerant. Yet I was astonished, coming face to face with the obvious and unimaginable. Everyone was in a gown that came down to the calves. I stayed for 20 minutes. I had a flight that afternoon. When Ramu stood up, the incongruity of the gown became painfully clear. I ignored it and we never mentioned the hospital clothing. We said bye very easily, too easily, as if for the first time we'd weighed the notion of not setting eyes on each other again that this moment in the ridiculous gown would be the last one we'd share and dismissed the thought at once. Thank you, Anna. <clears throat> it's interesting, I mean, here's a book where the longest first section is all about what you just said, not setting eyes on somebody uh, you wish to see, um, that sort of not seeing or being interrupted or having to go to some other place right away, being in constant motion are all character, uh, are characteristic of, um, especially, the, well, the whole book, really. But the book is, your book is set at a very specific historical moment, two years after um, the terrorist attack on the Taj Mahal Hotel, uh, when terrorists took over the hotel and, and um, shot people moving through it and, um, which is evoked in part in the book as, as your character goes to run his errand at the hotel. And two years also perhaps, I mean, that took place in 2008, the same year as the meltdown of the global economy. Um, and history is in this book that is about days, history is very much a pre presence, both in the sense you'll write at one point, Bombay is history's very antithesis, and yet as you wander around, you keep imagining Bombay actually uh, becoming, or the Bombay you knew becoming nothing but history. Um, and then there's a moment in the second section of the book um, when you and Ramu go back to a place important in your personal history, uh, the school you went to. And school, you know, if there's, if the Bombay attack was a terror attack, the, the, it's an incongruous form of terror, but one of the things you dwell on a good deal in the book is also your memories of being a terrified kid. There's a very funny section of going to school every morning and how you would, you would you know, uh, or your character would note all the, uh, the Catholic um, uh, statuary and so on and pray to them to release you from having to go to phys ed class. And, um, but you, you go down to that school and, and, Ramu is quite interested in architecture and, and, um, and you notice an old church there. Uh, and I think Ramu is also half Christian or, uh, and you go in to see the church and you write, history is always lying before you, uh, lying before you unnoticed till you see it as we do now. And I believe that's the end of the section. And one sense I want to say about that section in the book, how, how does the book see history? What do you see at that moment? You know, I mean, um, I, I've long believed, until recently, I mean, of course, when I was a child or when I was growing up, I, I thought history was what had happened in the past. And then um, his history had a historical air, um, which is why I disliked history for not being as ordinary as the present. I like about the present, it's unconsciousness of being itself. This is what seemed to make it so uh, 
so rich with surprise and possibility. Whenever the present turned into history, it became conscious of itself. It seemed burdensome to me as a writer, which is why I never wrote about big events. Even if the big event, event constituted a, a central moment like the reading, the, the authors come here to do a reading. I was always going to avoid describing such a reading because that would be like describing for a historian a central moment in, in history. And my job is not of the historian, but of the noticer. Mm -hmm. um, but at a, so, you know, I, I, ne I, I never liked historical films or historical novels, and I still don't like them with some exceptions, uh, because they, they, sh they display too much of an awareness of, you know, thing, the things in them, besides the people in them, seem to be all aware that they, they are in a historical epoch in a way that you and I are not aware, generally, of, of living in history. Mm -hmm. and, and gradually I began to find out that Lots of people weren't aware in those historical uh, epochs of, of, of living through historical epochs. So, so e even the people I, I, I knew who were older than me, who, who might have been through partition or independence in India, or may have gone to a, a concert, uh, a performance by John Coltrane, were, were not aware that at, that at that time that they were in history. And so I, I thought that the, 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 the historical novel gets it wrong. That, that, uh, but there are some artists like Tarkovsky, for instance, who show both the future and the past as being almost indistinguishable from the present in its ordinariness, in its traumas, in its, in its comedy, in, in, in its dailiness. People in Tarkovsky's past and future are not aware of being in the past and future and nor are the objects in them aware of being in the past or future. And, and I thought this is a bit like the way Sartre describes the adventure. Sartre is, one of his characters says, um, you're never, never aware of being in an adventure. To turn an event into an adventure, it is sufficient to recount it. So, the, 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 the kind of veneer and, and finish of story or storytelling is what makes history, history or an adventure, an adventure. I'm not interested in story. I'm interested in what happens outside of the story. So this is what I mean when I um, speak about history in this book as something like other things which you notice suddenly. Um, it's not a, a, a prefabricated thing out there. It's, it's something you, you notice from time to time. That, I, I'm not interested in the, in, in, in the history that's already available as an object through recounting and having clear markers as history. History is there at any point of time it takes a chance occurrence and a kind of inner alertness on your part, which is not necessarily attuned to, want to wanting to notice things, to notice anything, including the historical. And this is, these are the moments that I'm talking about in the book, including big moments like the terrorist attack, mm -hmm. which just happened, but comes to the to the narrator's consciousness as a slight dislocation. When he goes to the Taj, which was gutted and burnt during the terrorist attack, and he sees no sign of devastation in the Taj because it's been rebuilt to be made pristine, he has this slight sense of disorientation. He knows this Taj is, is, seems to be the Taj, and the Taj that I knew, this is the hotel, the Taj Mahal Hotel, but it's not actually that Taj but it looks exactly the same. 
So that's the that's the slight disorientation that the 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 narrator feels and constitutes his understanding of the world of the day and of history in this case. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say, um, Edwin, that in the past six months or so, I have become, I had become with the various protests that were happening in India and the bizarre kind of developments after the BJP came back to power in 2019, the bizarre developments to do with the change of status of Kashmir, various other things, um, the, the way freedom of expression seemed to be becoming more and more kind of rare. Okay. I, I did become aware for the first time in a very strange way um, that I was living in history. But, uh, but that mainly happened to me because of the number of ordinary people I saw taking part in protests and the way protests by very ordinary people um, transformed our understanding of who we were. Uh, yeah. What I mean by that, Edwin, is that people protesting against various things that were happening, including, I, I don't want to go into the complexities of this, the Citizenship Amendment Act, mm -hmm. uh, which said that, you know, we, we're going to give citizenship to refugees from neighboring countries, except Muslims. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when the protests against that happened, one suddenly realized that um, the human being as a category, something we've forgotten about because protests in the last 20 or 30 years have been on the be on behalf of race, identity, um, you know, but, but not on behalf of what we are as humans. Mm -hmm. The human is, in fact, is a, is, is, is a slightly, is a, is a, is a category under a question mark. A suspect uh, one. Yeah. Is a suspect one. And it yeah. seemed to be the province of the so-called you know, the, again, suspect liberal elite. Mm -hmm. Now, what was interesting in these protests, protests was that the human being as a category was being reclaimed by the person on the street, including the very traditional, let us say, Muslim woman in the hijab. Mm -hmm. They were humanists. Mm -hmm. They were saying they were not fighting for themselves as Muslims, but as human beings as Indians who were, who, who wanted to say that to be a, to be a, an Indian doesn't mean that you are a Hindu. It means you're a human being, which encompasses everything, every point of view, every religion. And, and that moved me a lot. This, uh, this, uh, this reclaiming and rejuvenation of, 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 of the category of the human, not by the usual suspects, but by a much wider uh, 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 set of inheritors of, 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 of that category, of what mm -hmm. it means to be human. I, I think possibly that might be happening today in, in, in America. Um, so so um, those kind of changes in meaning, again, made me newly aware of being in history in a way that I'm generally not aware. Yeah, well, and, and it's, it's interesting, your book, in a way, comes from or documents a moment, it sounds like there, and I, I hope here, well, of, of sort of the calmed apprehension that we lived through in the last, say, uh, well, actually, in many decades, really, the decades since Thatcher and Blair and so on, of seeming prosperity and seeming stability. And in a way, Ramu, Ramu the, you know, the Amit Chowdhury character, is successful if a little fretful about you know about his reputation and things like that and um, the Ramu character is is in part a character of, of generational uh, disaffection he's unsuccessful he's addicted he is he lives extraordinarily precariously he's in, he's in some sense stranded in a history that isn't doing anything for him and though you don't you never uh, in none of your works, as you say, do you, do you sermonize or polemicize? I think you do 
in this book to some extent capture the predicament of a time which was of somebody who was passed over by that time and do it in a very human way in the sense that, that we are all ultimately passed over by time. And this book, which is set betwixt and between, betwixt your, the parents' generation, a child's generation, betwixt and between places, uh, betwixt with a, a middle-aging character in effect and so on, is shadowed by the worry of, of political, not perhaps as much a bogus stability as political, uh, as a threatened uh, terror, though both are there, um, but also uh, a simple, uh, uh, the shadow of death falls across its pages. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, uh, with, with, with Ramu, in fact, it seems to be a, a confession he makes at a certain point that, um, well, he, he, he's alive, he's living, and he's hanging out with, with Amit, and uh, when he's back, they go around searching for good pommes frites fish in the restaurants and, and uh, Parsi cuisine, and... Uh, Pleasures are there, too, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, Pleasure is and, there too, yeah. And, and architecture, looking at buildings and, and all of that, uh, which, which Ramu, both Ramu and Amit love to do. Um, and in spite of that, um, Ramu does confess at some point in the past, I mean, this is Amit remembering it, that uh, life is the only option. You know, I mean, mm. it's it's not necessarily the best option. It's the only option you're given. Yeah. It's the kind of shadow of death that you're talking about, which uh, which is which Ramu kind of points out in a very matter of fact way. Yeah. In in all of us, the the kind of compulsion to accept as the best option what was actually the only option. Yeah. Uh, which is which is living. Um, so in the, in this book, I am concerned with with that, with, with what it means to have that only option where occasionally you feel like having another option. Um, but, but, um, but I'm also very interested in, in living itself, what, what that means to those who uh, have opted out of the conventional kind of parameters and destinations of, of being in the world, uh, but uh, what is what is, what is living, and how how might how might writing capture its shape, and is writing about living? Does live is the model of model that we kind of mentally inherit that the writer lives, gathers experience, and then writes about experience? Is that the model that that's actually a true model or do we is 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 writing itself another kind of experience and a form of living and in some ways indistinguishable from living um, and, and these are questions that that preoccupy me because I am having said grudgingly that it was the only option, having agreed with Ramu, uh, I am also deeply interested in the rhythms of what this option offers us and, and what its relationship to writing and is. Um, and, and I want to write about life that in a way that is a kind of living in this book, that the writing is a kind of living. And, and, and this, this is another preoccupation here. Mm -hmm. Well, the book has a very marked tempo. Um, it begins with a, a, a quote uh, from Walter Benjamin about revisiting the house of one's life, which you know, sort of plays out in, in this book about where, where Amit and, and, uh, um, and Ramu are looking at buildings all the time, the question, and Amit is thinking about the apartments he lived in in Bombay as a child. The question of home is very much present throughout it. But 
the rhythm is slow and it takes a while to move Ramu onto the page, really. He's more absent for a while, but I mean, it, it has a slow, leisurely beginning full of these noticings and these different threads. And then the last two sections pick up the pace very quickly. And the last, which actually is unforeseen and slightly festive and comical, brings Ahmet and his family to the Taj to stay in the Taj, a place they never would have thought of staying. And it interested me there that, that the Taj, of course, is a tomb, the real Taj. The other, and, and the, uh, the Taj that the hotel had been turned into a kind of tomb. And this very much overshadows your last pages. But at the same time, Ahmet and his family are there. It's comic because his daughter is endlessly scrolling on her cell phone and so on. All the usual uh, um, distractions and, and of, of, of uh, life are very much present too. So in the book about betwixt things being betwixt and between, you arrive at the end in a kind of suspense of the place, a place where people live and go through all the time, which is like life in general, but also a place where in some sense, a place that is a pseudo tomb or remembers a tomb or commemorates a tomb, but a place where actually life is going on. It's really, it's a, it's a lovely note and the speed with which the book picks up in the last sections. Um, well, it reminds me to some extent of, of your talking about in the book that you're going to bring out next year, finding the Raga about the pacing of the Raga that you, you, the beginning is a long introduction, which is that the book is more introduction or the piece of music is more introduction. Um, than it is conclusion, but that, uh, is there, this, this book that's coming up is also a, a, a Bombay book, and in a way it's almost, it, and it's uh, an essay that's also a memoir, but not really, so it also plays with genre in the way that you do in this book too. Right, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the, the new book, which is, which is going to come out next year, I think. Um, next spring, yeah. Next it wasn't come out in the fall, but we've, yeah. But yeah, yeah, because of the pandemic, we've it's coming out next year. Um, yeah, th th that's that's a book about my my relationship to my discovery of Indian classical music. Um, having grown up in Bombay with a with a great singer of Tagore songs as my mother of, of devotional songs, and uh, having grown up listening to um, to, to the Who and um, you know, Neil Young, etc., um, suddenly became uh, deeply drawn to Indian classical music at the age of 16 and began to learn it until I could perform it. And, and, I, and I thought that I, I shouldn't write a kind of neutral sort of account of Indian classical music. I should, I should write about how it came to exist in my life and through that write about the music. And, and that's a kind of essayistic kind of form that I have undertaken since the 90s, not to, not to pretend I'm not there, because it's very valuable that, that interface between myself and, and, and the thing it is I'm writing about. Um, and, 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 the, and the book follows that pattern, mm -hmm. follows that kind of interface. Mm -hmm. What is, I mean, the subtitle is an improvisation on Indian music. Um, Friend of My Youth is also a kind of improvisation. You could almost take the, the Benjamin quote as a kind of given material that you, that you riff off of throughout it. Uh, because you start by saying, you do, it's another case where you say you don't see what the connection is, but you always think of Ramu when you read this passage. Yes. Then you use the title of the book, you say, is the title of an Alice Munro story that you've never read. Yes. Um, and yes. then you say in, in, uh, in uh, Finding the Raga that um, Indian music is described as an improvisation, but Indian doesn't, Indian music, Indian doesn't really have a word for improvisation. Um, and, and that's because I mean, you sort of make a point of that. Yes. Um, in Indian music, yeah, it doesn't have a word for improvisation because um, it, it has some kind of words which which um, refer to elaboration, mm -hmm. but but 
but not in this kind of um, categorizing way in which you know Western commentators, when they try to make sense of Indian music, say it's improvisational. Mm -hmm. um, that that doesn't seem to be worth commenting on separately. Somebody might say that his elaboration was beautiful, or her elaboration went on for a bit longer than uh, than I thought it would. But uh, it, it, it's not taken to be a kind of definitive characteristic. This, mm -hmm. this it's taken for granted, uh, and I. I I do say one thing in, in the new book, yeah. uh, it, and, and I say that elaboration in Indian music, elaboration in Indian classical music is evasion. Um, so basically, a rag is not a scale, a rag is not a mode, it's a form of progression uh, from the lower tonic to the upper tonic and giving shape over a period of time to a particular progression, which is identified as that rag alone, although other rags might have exactly the same notes as that particular rag. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's, the, it's a particular progression which, of those notes which identifies it as it, it being a particular rag. So the life and uh, yeah. Yeah. No. So now you have you have a motif. You have a you have a kind of progression. You have a riff. You're, you're, you are elaborating on that very slowly. But while you elaborate on that, you somehow evade um, immediately, kind of giving shape to the to the recognizable stock phrases. Mm -hmm. You come to it at an angle. So if, if, if you're supposed to touch a particular note, you don't touch it straight away. You go to the next note and then come back to that note which you're supposed to touch. This is what I mean when I say elaboration or improvisation in Indian classical music is synonymous with evasion. Evasion or not getting to the point is seen to be the principal beauty of art. Um, the larger point that, that, that this strategy, which would seem pointless as a way of sort of, and this again is how your novel in a way works, the noticings, the incident, the coincidences, the incidents, in effect, bring in a whole world around it. So that, though, so that the whole environment that is, whether it be historical, temporal, that is in some sense implicated in the old sense of implication, folded in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the ongoing improvisation, uh, which you also make the point is a word that doesn't exist in Indian because that's, in, in, for Indian music, because that's what music is. It is this form of noticing, this form of ongoing response to not only the musical material, but to the world at large. Yeah, it's a form of noticing, it's a form of acknowledging that the main thread by which you recognize something uh, is not the main point of interest. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the point of interest is how you depart from it and come back to it and what you do in that time. Yeah. How much, to what extent can you do it within the laws that govern such improvisation? Mm -hmm. uh, beauty comes from fresh imaginings of these departures and returns. Um, and, and, and this is, this is what, what, what writing for me is as well. I now realize after 30 years, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it, it, that there, there have been sort of readers in India who have said to me, come to the point, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I, I would say to them, as I said in my first novel, A Strange and Sublime Address, there is no point except those acts of noticing. There never was a clear, real story within quotes with beginning, middle, and end. It was always about what was on the margins of the story that was, that was interesting. This, I think, actually is true of all art. Even those works of art in which story seems central, like, let's say, Hitchcock, 
vertigo. There's so much happening on the margins of what's actually going on that makes Hitchcock stand out from other directors or storytellers who would have, on, who would have only concentrated on the story and thereby would not have been Hitchcock and would have yeah. produced another Hollywood film about a murder or whatever it was. Okay. There um, is the, the American critic D.A. Miller has, has done a series of essays looking at movies, notably Vertigo, one of them, where um, you're taking advantage of the way in which you can stop and start the movies on, you know, on a tape or streamed or what you will. He, he observes precisely the detail which you wouldn't necessarily observe in the, in, in the watching of the movie to try and look at the making it, to try and bring out its character. We should probably uh, take some questions at this point, I think. Um, so let's do that. Hi, hey, I'm back. Um, before we take questions real quick, for anyone who was joining us late, um, I just want to reiterate that uh, tonight we're donating all of the profits that we make to uh, organizations fighting anti-racism, bail funds, legal funds. Um, so I'm going to be reposting links to purchase tonight's book and also a link to donate directly into the chat. Um, I just want to, you know, we had a lot of people join us um, after my introduction, so I just want to throw that back out there. So now on to questions. Uh, our first question is from Michael Riemann. Um, I know you want to maintain a distance between the amit of the novel and yourself. Can you nevertheless note any ways in which your view of Bombay differs from that of the narrator? No, I mean, I think uh, our views are very similar, uh, except that, you know, neither of us knew what these views were until they kind of emerged on the page. Um, in, in, in that sense, I mean, I think what's more real is the act of writing. Um, and uh, whether the Amit on the page or the Amit who's writing are one and the same or different is a secondary question in comparison to what they're both learning and discovering about themselves in the process of writing. Um, so it's not as if Amit has some point of view which he's putting into the head of the Amit on the page. Uh, the writing is central. It's emerging, creating both these Amits. Um, it's not as if one Amit is the creator and the other one is there as a character. Again, I would say it's the writing that's, that, that for both of them would be the surprise. Um, our next question comes from Kevin Dean. Your work seems very autobiographical. To me, this has been one of the most interesting parts of reading your novels, the realism and the intimacy and the authenticity of your voice, all of, all of which speaks to, uh, to something lived rather than simply imagined. With this in mind, do you begin with the personal memories and then let them lead you to something like narrative? Or rather, do you begin more with an idea of a particular story that you want to tell or how you want to tell it and then find that memories in your own life begin to seep into your writing and then take over? So, I mean, as I've said before, um, yes, fair enough. I mean, I, I, I write a lot from, for the want of a better term, my life. Um, although, I mean, I have to say that, again, immediately, one has to qualify that, say, even in connection with friend of my youth. I mean, no visit of that kind where I went to Bombay, stayed in such a club, read out, something from The Immortals, my fifth novel, the next day. N nothing like that actually ever happened. It seems to have happened. In fact, now I think it happened because, of, because it happened in the book, you know. Uh, and I rely on the book to, to tell me about what happens in my life. I rely on my books to kind of remind me that this is, that I must have lived like this, but much of it is, it's not invented, but it's, it hasn't actually happened in that kind of way. Um, secondly, I would say that I think of autobiography as being a record of one's life. While my life is something quite nebulous, it's just a starting point 
for what Edwin was talking about as being acts of noticing. So what I'm, what, what, what the book is full of is not somebody's life or my life, but this starting point leading to, to what's seen and heard and experienced. Um, so, an, an autobiography or an autobiographical novel might have lots of stuff to do with what happened to that person at this point in their lives or at another point as a, in a kind of narrative arc. While I talk about all the things that didn't happen, all the things that I noticed by chance, and which I maybe at that time didn't even think uh, worth kind of preserving in my memory in some way, but which 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 has returned to me. Oddly, I, I think I think uh, I mean Eliot, T. S. Eliot is not a not a person you associate with. You know, talking about memory, uh, unlike let's say you do Proust, but but I think Eliot uh, in one of his essays said that uh, why is it that we often forget the the, the important events in our life while certain unimportant moments will, after years, come back to us for no reason. So I, I, I'm, I'm a person who organizes those, those moments, uh, which happened in my life, but are not necessarily my life. They certainly happened in my life. I mean, I had to live for, for those things to happen. This is the thing about that, that option, the option of living. <laughs> it, it's, it's the only option. But again, I mean, it opens up onto these kind of amazing things, which at that time you didn't think were amazing. You realized that 15 years later that standing at this railway platform then was quite amazing. I mean, I, I don't want to say this in a feel-good way, but I mean, slightly unfathomable, both its significance and the way it comes back to you. So life is the only domain in which these these, these kind of these things return and in as much as that that happens yes it's 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 my life my life provides that kind of occasion my life is an occasion for that to happen your life has an occasion i loved it um next question uh your novel seems very dreamlike missing someone losing someone atmosphere changing locales changing past and present shifting transformations, not necessarily of the protagonist choosing. Um, this one was lodged not really as a question, just as a comment, but I'm going to turn it into a question, uh, which is, is there a, an extent to which the, the notion of dreaming or, or dream logic does fit into your, your style or your sense of, of story, story or narrative? I haven't thought about it. I mean, um, uh, I think uh, I, I like the idea of of chance and, and accident. I also like the idea that chance accident, and accident can appear very logical. I think dreams, when you dream them, seem very logical. I think the great kind of writers who write slightly weird things never seem to be aware that they're, that they're writing about weird things. Um, I'm thinking about Borges, I'm thinking about various others, um, Kafka. Kafka's world is extremely normal, um, and I think that he, that, that, that he sh that his world shares that with dreams. That, that, that you know everything that happens in them at the time. It's only rarely that you are aware that I might be in a dream, something this quite bizarre. But in the dream, it's all it all has a kind of great air of of normality or normalcy, and um, and I love that in 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 writers. This air of detached calm, which 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 I think might be what this person means by dreamlike, logic, detachment, and calm. Never feel that you are in a moment in history like a man dressed up as Henry VIII might feel. He's certainly not in a dream. He's in a costume drama. But if you're not aware that anything weird is happening, then you probably are in a dream. So it's, 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 it's that part of dreaming, the calmness of it, the seeming sort of naturalness of everything. That, that I would agree, that, that bit, yes, I, I am interested in. 
Um, our next question, your reading reminds me of the poetry of Elizabeth Bishop. Would you say your work is in conversation with hers or poetry in general in any way? Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. I, 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 I mean, not just Bishop, I love Elizabeth Bishop. I mean, uh, I, I discovered her in the American Center Library in Bombay. Not her personally, but, but her books. Um, in fact, the one book, Collected Poems. Um, I think uh, I think I might have become aware of her through Robert Lowell. Again, not because I, I knew Lowell and he told me to go and look up Elizabeth Bishop's work, but but reading a biography of Lowell. Um, you know that he was a great admirer of Bishop. And so th th that's the kind of train through which you discover things. Bishop is amazing. Um, I mentioned that, that moment in, let's say, in 19... 78 or whatever when I discovered Bishop when I was also discovering Indian classical music as it happened uh, Because because you know there are things Yeah, things you discover. It's very important Not to inherit kind of canonical stuff and I neither inherited Indian classical music or Elizabeth Bishop as part of a canon You know um, And Bishop certainly at that time was maybe just coming into the canon uh, you know, she wasn't as kind of well known in her lifetime or even a little after her lifetime as she is uh, now. Her last geography, yeah, anyway, it was, at the end of her life, she began to get the attention she had not really received before. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But even so, you know, when I was growing up, it was all about, when you, when you thought about American poetry, it was Sylvia Plath, you know, and, and, and Robert Lowell was, uh, who had that kind of prestige. Um, anyway, Certainly in conversation with all kinds of poetry, the, the, it was thinking to myself, the bit that I read out today about the, the mm, one of the kind of seeming last meetings with, with Ramu that the narrator has, where he wonders, well, is this a final meeting in the psychiatric wing of the GT hospital? I, I think I must be in conversation with a poem called Kadesh by, by Ginsberg which I read a long time ago and then reread and uh, I think it's an extraordinary poem. Um, and and, and uh, again with Ginsberg, it's, 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 uh, it's a process of discovery because when I was young, I mean, Ginsberg used to be seen mainly as a, a very kind of voluble self-publicist rather than a poet. Only later did I discover what, a, what an amazing poet he was. And Kaddish, uh, um, yeah, so that, that kind, of, kind of conversation is, is happening a lot, I think. Um, our next question, these are very terrific questions. Thank you all for submitting. Um, our next question, would you consider Friend of My Youth autofiction uh, if an event into, is turned into autofic, excuse me, if an event uh, is turned into an adventure, what event was the primary trigger for this book? Um, really enjoyed the book and plan to reread it from Willie. Thank you, thanks. Um, I, I know I don't think of it as autofiction mainly because I mean, I didn't know what autofiction was until the book began to get reviewed and I came across this term. Um, I, I, had, I had dealt with autobiographical fiction on my life and, and had to kind of rebuff it. Uh, and then, then along came autofiction, um, which which kind of puzzled me uh, because of its kind of technical sort of um, air that that term. Um, but the the question is interesting in in terms of what is it that prompted the the narrative. Um, I, I think I think there are a few things. I mean. But, but most, most, most powerfully, it was the absence of this friend. It was the absence of this friend in a Bombay where I was only a visitor. So the absence of the friend and my awareness that I could only ever now be a visitor and somebody who stayed in hotel rooms and in club rooms in the city in which I'd grown up, gone to school, hated school, 
suffered, been miserable, uh, been with my parents, my parents' city. I could only now come here and stay in a hotel room. Um, these two things at some point came to me as it does when, when living becomes a kind of writing in, in that these two things began to seem to me um, something that could become writing, could become, could become a work. The work had begun then. I've, I've, I've said elsewhere that you don't start a work when you write something on paper or when you type something in a computer. It, it starts at a different point. I don't know where it ends. Um, so the, the, this was not so much just a prompting, but, but this work kind of coming into existence. Um, I, I was worried as I am with every work that I've undertaken, whether it's musical or whether it's in the domain of fiction or anything else, as to whether it was feasible, whether it was tenable as an idea of wanting to write a book about not seeing a friend again and not being at, not having a place to stay in, 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 in one city. The whole business about the terrorist attacks and Taj came later, though it was part of that as well. Uh, wanting to write a book about, in, in, with, with that being the subject of the book without it having any ostensible subject or story or plot. Um, I was thinking, is it possible? Uh, and, and then I embarked on it. So, uh, so th those, those are the two things, I think. Uh, and this is our last question. This is sort of a variant on the, last, on the previous question, um, but I think it's an interesting one to explore. Uh, would this book have been different if it had been just a straightforward memoir? Um, and then a, a coda to that question, would it have been any different if the protagonist was not named Amit Chaudhuri? Um, so good question again. Um, if it had been a memoir, yes, it would have been different. Uh, I would not have been able to capture the rhythms of the day. Um, uh, similar, similarly, Odysseus Abroad, which I wrote because I had this idea that, you know, I want to write about my uncle in London, uh, you know, this guy who was unmarried. And it seems to me that he's a bit like Odysseus. And that when I used to go to his place, when I was a student in London in 1984, 80, 83, 84, 85, I used to go to his place and go inside to his kitchenette to get myself a glass of water. I was Telemachus, you know. Um, and I thought maybe I could write a long essayistic kind of memoir. When I started writing it, I thought that no, this is not this is not happening the way I wanted to happen. And then I all then I then I took the cue from from Ulysses from from uh, Joyce's book and decided to tell the story in one day in a much more compressed way. It's a short book. I prefer writing short books. So. Um, um, I, I think a memoir would have that air of recountedness, which I don't mind when I encounter it in others, but I, which is generally something that I'm very uncomfortable with as a writer. Even A Strange and Sublime Address, my first novel, about a child's visit from Bombay to his uncle's house in Calcutta. It had no other plot. You know, I wanted it to be about living in the present moment and discovering from moment to moment what's going to happen. That I don't think I can do if I recount it. If I had written it as a recounting of something in my childhood. It had to be something that was happening now where I would discover what would happen next only when it happened. Uh, yeah, it's, it's that recounting. I, that's why the passage in Roland Barthes speaks to me where he speaks about the kind of unreal time of novels, histories, and cosmogenies. He says, says it's always in the simple past tense. Novels, he quoting from Valerie, says, be, uh, always begin with a sentence such as, the marchioness went out at five o'clock. Uh, and that's, that's what one wants to avoid. 
just 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 temperamentally in my, in my case excellent um that's all we have time for tonight um i, I want to thank you amit for joining us uh so early in the morning this was absolutely terrific um, you must have stayed up all night drinking coffee. Dawn come, you've seen Dawn arrive in Calcutta behind you. <laughs> I have. I have. I was very Dawn excited. Dawn morning. Dawn to morning. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've got a long day ahead of you. Um, Edwin, thank you as always. Um, My pleasure. Thanks, thanks Amit. Thanks, thanks, Al. Thanks, Edwin. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, thanks to the MRB Classics for um, continuing on the series with us. We have more to come next Tuesday. Um, you can sign up for that on our website. Um, and then we have more throughout the summer that we're getting ready to program. Um, and again, uh, uh, please consider donating to the causes that we highlighted earlier. Um, we will be uh, donating all of those, all, any profits from tonight to those um, organizations and the NYRB will be matching us. Um, so again, thank you, Edwin. Thank you, Amit. And everyone, please, uh, you know, be healthy, be safe, um, be well. Good thank night. you so much for this. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.